Okay, thank you, Michael. Uh, I'm also another speaker from Cleveland, but from a different uh, institution, the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, this whole femtosecond laser technology in terms of what's it going to look like in the future? Where, where are we going with this technology overall? Uh, I am a consultant for Alcon. I'm also co-founder and investor and consultant with Lenzar. And the whole issue here is really femtosecond laser photo disruption, the idea of focusing light, creating a plasma, doing some ablation, then having a bubble form which cleaves tissue, and then a small gas bubble remains. And so really two mechanisms of tissue interaction are present, both out of ablation and cleaving uh, to separate the tissue. Now we saw that, that the laser really did a great job in replacing the blade and refractive surgery for LASIK. Now about 70% or more of, of LASIK procedures in the United States are being done with a femtosecond laser. And that's based on a whole host of different femtosecond lasers that are, being, or that are approved for use uh, in the U.S. and around the world, which have some different parameters but, but work somewhat similarly overall. You can see here that the idea of the pulsing and sequence uh, can be made to, to get a nice contiguous cut. Uh, a little higher energy means a little less density of spacing. There are some lasers that are very low energy as well, like the Zemer, where there's very close spacing, uh, but the same kind of effects are achieved. Um, with the cornea, there's, there's things like lenticular extraction where a femtosecond laser can create a lenticule and pull it out. So it can be very versatile with regard to the cornea. And of course, uh, shaped corneal transplants have been proposed with femtosecond lasers. And there's a whole host of different corneal applications such as channels for intacts, pockets for inlays, and even astigmatic incisions, which is now what we're seeing with the femtosecond lasers being used for cataract surgery is that they make incisions decisions for uh, wound entry and also for correction of astigmatism. So the whole concept of all laser cataract surgery is built off the platform of femtosecond lasers over the past decade and now gives us a whole host of new cutting interactions that will allow us to, to get better results for our patients overall. Uh, some of the differences in the femtosecond which you've heard is the idea of whether there's a curved applanation versus a fluid interface and I think the fluid interface introduces sort of a new potential improvement in being lighter touch overall to the, to the cornea and to the eye and, and maybe more of what we'll see in the future. A little bit with a curved interface, the issues can be that uh, the interface can cause a little bit of scatter, there can be compression of the cornea causing some uh, changes in the focus of deeper structures. And what I like about the fluid interface is just like immersion ultrasound is a more superior way of doing biometry for measuring so a fluid will allow even for the imaging caliber to be a little bit sharper and better. I also equate this to the idea that if in the future I'd like to see maybe where fluid begins to be used for other corneal procedures such as a femtosecond laser or lamellar, lamellar keratoplasty where if you were treating a scar that was irregular you might be able to define the exact shape to get the, the right kind of post-operative outcome where the scar shape is not translated just to a deeper level. Uh, maybe even some kind of femto deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty might be done in the future or uh, uh, a uh, endothelial keratoplasty or even something like the flex procedure being done with a fluid interface to maybe get a more uh, precise lay of pulses and this is just some of the things that we might spill over into corneal technology. Uh, with the Lenzar system one of the things that we're, we're in the midst of just finding and developing is the time of having uh, the, the concept of having real-time adjustment for motion and relaxation during the actual corneal incision part because with a fluid interface any small motion would disrupt where your incision is being done and so the image would intend to cut uh, um, a site at three cross-sectional angles and then locate uh, based on markers exactly where it is and, and by real-time feedback being able to, to get a nice corneal incision to be done overall and have this process be entirely automated. Um, some of the imaging that's used that facilitates this kind of treatment and the cataract surgery treatments that you've seen is, is based on 
OCT technology or something called 3D confocal uh, structured illumination. Uh, some of the things that we see already is automatic detection for very quick capture of image locations. But in the future, I'd like to see where the robustness of being able to measure all the different uh, densities of the lens might allow us to custom adjust the best energy and pattern of laser fragmentation based on what we see in the imaging with a feedback loop. And I think that's something that's on the horizon. Uh, Harvey Uwe's already done some things where he's used this kind of shine flug imaging uh, with a laser shine flug to get very precise imaging of density, quantitate some of that density, and in comparative studies, being able to show, first of all, whether there's enough room to, to be able to get to the cortex with chopping techniques, but also to correlate it with LOX3 uh, grading of cataracts. And that shows that once you can grade that kind of uh, cataract density, maybe you can program your laser to treat accordingly. Uh, in the future, I, I would hope that we will see things like capsular refilling techniques for cataract surgery that restores accommodation. Right now, the, the concept of having uh, single optic accommodating IOLs doesn't work that well. Uh, um, Two dual optic accommodating lenses have had their own issues, but if we could actually refill the capsular bag, we might get really robust accommodation back um, uh, with the cataract surgery, and this would all be facilitated by femtosecond lasers. Uh, here just shows some of the steps of making very small capsular incisions, removing a pre-treated nucleus with a femtosecond laser uh, by just aspiration, and then sealing up, injecting the, uh, the uh, filling material and then sealing up the uh, edge to have a closed system. Uh, accommodation restoration is important, and, and the concept of maybe using the laser for accommodation restoration is also a, a good thing with intralenticular photo disruption. Uh, that might follow any of a number of different patterns that we're currently investigating, and uh, this just shows that in some monkey studies we've done, we show that we can place very high levels of energy uh, inside the nucleus and not get a progressive cataract with good clarity of the retina postoperatively. And we've seen this also in patients where we can do the treatments and any uh, disruptive area bubbles in the beginning, all the bubbles disappear very nicely. And so far we've seen some marginal results with occasional patients that show objective accommodation that give us some hope to see this as a future technology. I think femtosecond lasers might be used for other technologies such as index of refraction change. Uh, typically the photo disruption threshold is at a certain level, but if you go below that threshold, threshold, you won't get a, an actual bubble or a photo disruption, but you'll get a very subtle effect that can change the index of refraction of the cornea, of the lens, or of an IOL. And this image down here below is showing, not, not invisible, but by, by special imaging techniques, the kind of lines and shapes that can be created in the cornea or lens or an IOL uh, that are completely invisible to the naked eye, but are just small changes in index of refraction. And, and I think maybe customizing IOLs after they've been implanted might be something we'll see with femtosecond lasers in the future. Now, all these internal uh, type findings in the lens and the cornea are going to really be fueled as further developments uh, because of where we are with cataract surgery. We have a very large baby boomer population in the United States where there's going to be a lot more aging people who need cataracts and they're going to be interested in refractive outcomes because they grew up in this, in this era of LASIK and refractive precision. And so I believe there's going to be a lot more money and, and, and uh, an interest in pursuing this in the future, which is going to help fuel the further innovation to take it uh, into new, new heights. I believe in the future we'll, we'll actually see where maybe a femtosecond laser photo disruption is, is targeted at trabecular meshwork for glaucoma treatment. And I believe we may even get to the point where we can cut vitreous bands, uh, even in the posterior retina, by using special optical techniques to get our femtosecond laser deep inside the eye. Uh, this is just some studies that we're currently doing with uh, uh, Holger Lubaschowski in Germany, where we've taken femtosecond lasers in a model eye with a turbid me media where we can correct all the aberrations with adaptive optics and then show that in a non-corrected situation where more energy is, is required to get some kind of an optical effect by using adaptive optics, we can use much lower energies because we get a much finer spot to the point where our visible, bu visible bubbling has been cut in half and in terms of forming an actual hole, it's all 
also significantly reduced to a lower value just by using optical methods to make our femtosecond lasers more precise. The concept would be to just use a certain threshold pulse that might help us to do online real-time imaging and then do pulses right across a vitreous band that might allow us to uh, release tension and then do a non-invasive uh, vitrotomy procedure. So overall, in conclusion, refractive and corneal surgery has been revolutionized by femtosecond lasers delivering highly localized stromal cuts for precision greater than any scalpel. And we're seeing this billing into an intraocular tool now for femtosecond laser in cataract surgery, in lens surgery of a whole different varieties. We're going to have better lasers, better imaging, better interfacing in the future, and just better treatments. And uh, I think we're going to see a number of new indications such as uh, um, presbyopic solutions, uh, glaucoma, vitroretinal, and other things in the future. So thank you very much for your attention.